Welcome to The Vergecast, the flagship podcast of surprise interviews. I'm your friend David Pierce. I didn't tell anyone we were doing this podcast. We're just here. We're podcasting. <laughs> Neil Patel is here. Hi, Neil. Welcome back. Hi. I'm on the show. I, I know people have been very confused. I was just doing the code conference, and what I said to David right before we started is, I've hosted enough things, so David, can you just drive this, and I'll just, I'll just sink back into being a guest. Yeah. That seems nice. <laughs> Every people bring you M and M's. It seems nice, you know. Yeah, I like this for you. Yeah, you've you've moved. You've done code. You get to like be a person now. This is very exciting. Yeah, we're just glad to rea- have you blind back. reacting to things. This episode of the Virtcast, <laughs> in many ways, the entire theme is Neilai reacts. Yeah, this this episode's <laughs> gonna be very fun because the first half is stuff that you know about, and the second half is stuff you don't know anything about. <laughs> it's gonna be great. Alex Kranz is here. Hi, Alex. I didn't know I was doing this podcast until about five minutes ago. I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> I knocked this on both of your doors and I said, it's podcast time. It's <laughs> like, okay, put on some pants, we're here, let's go. Um, we have a lot to talk about this week. Meta Connect was this week. Uh, we got a bunch of news about AI, all kinds of stuff going on. New Raspberry Pi, which I'm weirdly excited about. Mac OS Sonoma is this week. By the way, I just bought a Raspberry Pi 4. I'm, I feel like an idiot. But like, it'll be fine. It was, re- it was really cheap. No, but it's good. Yeah. You can do Home Assistant. Yeah, as a like smart home sensor or whatever, the 4 will, will do. You shot like how you immediately guessed what I was using it yeah, for. Yeah, <laughs> listen, you just <laughs> moved house. It's not unclear. Uh, <laughs> We have big trials going on all over the place. We're going to talk a little bit about those today, and we're going to talk a bunch about those next week. Uh, but let's start with code. Code was the we, – we've been working up to code for months. There was a ton going on. We booked a ton of guests. We talked to a ton of people. It got real weird right at the end. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Neelai, you you co-hosted this thing. Congratulations. You, you, you made it through. You're back. Seemed like it went really well. Should we start at the end? Can we start anywhere <laughs> other than Linda? Oh, look, we here is my goal at code. And I, I'm just going to say this. I, this is how I booked everybody. I know everybody thinks about Kara when they think of code because Kara is Kara. And she has run the conference really well for the past couple of years. The conferences I started going to as a little baby that changed my career around were hosted by Walt in Kara. Mm-hmm. Right? All the the things. Steve Jobs on stage at Code. Steve Jobs and Bill Gates on stage. Which, by the way, has a like lore and drama behind it. That's Walt. I, and like, I just not like, it's both of them. And I don't mean to detract anything from like Kara, but like there's a, there's a Walt component there. And like, I'm on that coaching tree. <laughs> like just to be really clear, like Walt was my mentor. He, we did the podcast together. Uh, he was on our staff. Like there's just a, a piece of that, that I was thinking about a lot as we were like doing the conference and like making a conference, which is very challenging. And again, I know like Kara did an amazing job with that. That's a high standard to live up to. Yeah. I'm not trying to detract from that. I'm just saying everyone thinks about that. And I was thinking about the before that. And what I really wanted on stage was to be a product reviewer, was to talk about products, right? The Walt side of the equation. Um, and we put a lot of products on that stage. So I'm like very proud of that, right? Adobe launched Photoshop for the web. Mike Krieger from Artifact launched what is effectively a Twitter competitor. <laughs> uh, there's a bunch. We can we can get to all that. Yeah. But I that that's like the part of code that you know there's a lot of drama. But if you actually look at our conference and you look at how much we talked about NVIDIA H100 GPUs on stage, like we made a tech conference, like a yep. tech yeah. tech conference, uh, and that's pretty cool. And we got a True Detective trailer. Like that's and we had a True Detective trailer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's wonderful. Like there was a lot going on at this conference, yeah. and then there was like one little bit of chaos, which I will happily talk about. <laughs> yeah. So but, we we should do that first because that that yeah, continues yeah. to be kind of the the thing on a lot of people's minds right now, partly because of what Lindy Acarina, the CEO of X, talked about on stage, and partly because of just the. I don't know, the scenery around it. Uh, the interview you can watch in full on our YouTube channel or on the Decoder podcast. I listened to it uh, while walking my son in a stroller this morning, which is a deeply oh, weird my. way. Like just the... the That's how your son is a supervillain now. That's <laughs> yeah, his origin The story. like cognitive dissonance of that was a very strange 45 minutes. When I was a wee lad, <laughs> I heard the sounds of Linda Yaccarino. <laughs> emanating from my father's headset and now now i have to destroy humanity to save it uh but yeah so she uh you you can go listen to the interview it's really interesting but the like the way the interview happened seemed to be as big a thing as anything because yoel roth who used to be what was his job at twitter back when it was twitter i had a trust yeah okay. twitter. he was a sort of surprise guest early and talked about a lot of the things that twitter has struggled with over the years i don't think he 
broke a huge amount of new ground in terms of like problems we've known about on that platform for a very long time. But then Linda was sort of forced to answer for a lot of those in a way that she didn't seem super psyched about answering for. Yeah, look, Linda did a shit job. Like, I, I don't. She did. I, like, we can make a lot of excuses, and and like, Yol is like a very convenient excuse, and like, that's great. Uh, she sucked. Like, what, what do we? What do you want me to? Say? I interview a lot of CEOs all the time. Yeah. You can go listen to them. Uh, you know, we don't shy away from hard questions. You know what? You, you know what you get with Kara Swisher, right? Like, uh, she did a bad job. Like, and like, I I can talk about the setup there. I just don't want to give her the out. I, I think if you're the CEO of a, of a major company that is the Global Town Square, da, 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 you better be ready. You should at least have some numbers, I would say, about how well you're doing instead of she spent a lot of time not answering questions about how well are you doing and instead talking about her feelings about how well they're doing, which we've learned over the years is when you should be really alarmed about how well something is doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me get to the setup and then we can talk about that. But I I don't want to, for one (laughs) second, let anyone walk away from this thinking that the setup or the chaos of Yol or whatever, the surprise of it should have, is an excuse. There there are lots of choices you can make. If you don't want to be, you could, she could have just walked away and she might (laughs) have, right. But she chose to be on the stage and all she had to say, she stayed a long time. She wanted to be on yeah. that stage, yeah. which is an important piece of puzzle. So let me just talk about the setup. So as Rich House listeners know, uh, one of our star guests was supposed to be uh, GMC of Mary Barra. Uh, and she dropped out because of the strike. And we made a lot of fun at her <laughs> to go to stage <laughs> for dropping out because of the strike. Um, so we, you know, there's like a last minute scramble to replace your guests. We have, you know, people pay to attend the conference. We want to put on a good, good show for them. Um, so we we booked the CEO of Rivian, RJ Scarn. She was, he great. was great. And he was like sort of the one-to-one replacement. And we can... I, I tried so hard to make him talk shit about the cyber shock. Uh, we can talk about that, but uh, that's sort of the one-to-one replacement, but everyone was like working hard to replace him, uh, including Kara, right. Who had no obligations to this conference really. Um, but she, you know, she did it. So she uh, was going to interview John Lovett and I was going to be like the Kara comedy show in the middle of our thing to get Kara back on stage. But then she asked Yol to do it and Yol said, yes. And the history of code, and code is unlike every other conference, every other conference. And David has worked at a lot of media companies. Every other conference gets corrupted by advertising or sales response. Like the history of code. And before that, the all things D conference, like Walt and Carol, like we're doing whatever you want and you can show up here. And they had the capital to mm-hmm. do it. And this is like a, again, like these are people that I've worked with and around who are my seniors, me going to their, conference when I was like a $12 a post reporter at Engadget like that that stuff is all in my brain like I'm taking over this legacy so our conference is the same right we invite people we say we you know we, we have a lot of conversations about you know it's a show like it's me interviewing another person there's prep calls and we like chat about what they want to say and what I want to say but they don't get the questions ahead of time in particular the most important part of code is audience questions, which Linda refused to take. Yeah. Um, and there's just an element of chaos, like journalistic chaos that makes code code. It's unlike any other conference for those reasons. And I have texts in my pocket from Walt before the show and after the show reminding me that that is what his conference was all about and what Kara's conference was all about. Yeah. Yeah. He always used to say the thing that we do here is yep. journalism. And it's like that. That's the spirit of that is very real. Live journalism. That's the thing. Yeah. That they, and they both said it. Yeah. I just again, I, I, I'm just coming back to the foundations of code. So whatever, we are all trying to fill in for Mary Vera and put on a good show and make it good. And so Kara's like, Yo's going to do it. And that's great. Like, fine. And so, and Linda knew this information, right? Like there was a lot of consternation about what she would drop out or not. We should tell her, like, obviously. So Kara knows her, she texted her. She knew, she knew the entire day. And basically we spent the day being like, is she going to show up or not? Like, who knows? Maybe she won't. That'll be its own news. She showed up. So that uh, that's like the whole backstory. Yeah. And yeah. And the, like, I think the, the backstory of it and the interview are sort of two different things. And yeah. Uh, the interview itself actually for all of the drama around it is not that interesting. Like Julia Borston did a really good job of trying to get her to say something interesting and revelatory about what's going on at X. And there's, can I, can I just say something about Julia? Please. Julia is incredible. And like watching Julia work up close, um, was like, I was like, Oh, I have a, I have a long way to go. <laughs> uh, like that's really how I feel like, Oh, I've got a yeah. long way to go. Um, 
She is overprepared. She knows her <laughs> shit cold. She knows everybody. Um, there's one thing when you're, you know, when you're like near someone for a long time, and you're like watching them work, you like notice things about them. Uh, when Julia is in the middle of an interview and she knows that she has it, she smiles like it, mm. and like maybe it doesn't come through on, on TV, but like in person, I was like, oh, I can see that she has it. It, it was incredible. It's like the, the poker hand. Like I have I have a good hand. Tell. Yeah, It's like the tiniest little tell. And she's like, <laughs> I'm holding a knife. Um, it's great. Like all that's great. Yeah. Um, the Linda interview was pure chaos, right? And because of Yol and because Linda des- had decided, I think inaccurately and inappropriately decided that she could blame all of her problems on Yol. Yes. Um, she kept going back to it, and you know, and that's like a sympathetic position. I, I I understand why, like sort of intuitively, like I could just be like mad about Yol, and everyone in this room will care about. It. But she knew. But she knew. And if you, but if you watch Julia, she, all of her like cable news anchor training, she's like, I don't, I'm moving on. Like, I'm not going to let you do this. Yeah. And that was that part of it. If you're like a journalism nerd, go back and watch that interview. Don't pay attention to Linda. Pay attention to Julia. Agreed. And it is actually just revelatory. Like I, again, I walked away thinking I have a lot to learn about how to do this. Just the ability to constantly say, can I finish my question is yeah. like a real, it's a real skill can I finish my question, David? to do in front of a lot of people. <laughs> it's very impressive. Right. There's a room full yeah. of people, some of whom are not on any one side, right? They're just like there for the train wreck. Yeah. Some of whom are there and they're very sympathetic to Linda and some of whom are there and they're very sympathetic, like whatever it is, or they're mad at Twitter, whatever it is. And like the tension in that room was out of control. And so mm. for Julia to stay locked in and focused on, I'm going to ask the questions. Uh, again, it, watch that side of it because it is incredible. Yeah, and it's like hard questions. About halfway through, she she kind of manages to get Linda off of blaming Yol for all of her responses, which was yeah. like, like yeah. the first half of it, she's, <laughs> she, she makes <laughs> a lot of remarks. <laughs> About yeah. like, yeah, no one knew he was here today. Would have yeah, been nice like ever, to know. I promise you. You know what? Like, we all saw what app she had on her phone. Yo, it was on the schedule. <laughs> yeah. Right? He was like listed publicly on the schedule. Yeah. We updated yeah. the app like 50 times because we were, we were moving the things. Because she, you know, Linda had first insisted on being last. Mm-hmm. She wanted to close. Great. And then she was like, I know I want to go before you. And then she switched it back. So like, actually, the schedule was moving all day. It's like you there. None of this was a secret. In okay. fact, more of it should have been a secret. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Yeah, Alex, you you and I have both watched the interview since the, the full thing got posted. Did you take anything of like substance away from it about X, the company or platform? Like, do you did I did took a lot it? about it from the hostility towards journalism that I saw mm. in it? Like, that was the main thing I took away was we've seen that thread of hostility from the company since Elon took over and saw it very apparently on stage and knowing now that like she knew because you watch it initially and you're like, Oh, she just found out. Yeah. I'd probably be that pissed on stage too. Like, no, if you knew the whole day. Right. And by the way, not to say anything about Yol, Yol is great. And you know, he, he's very compelling and he knows a lot of shit about trust and safety. There was no content in his interview that he had not shared before. Right. Right. Like, like the things he was saying was things he said, quite often about the yeah. company that he has put and in the New York times. But by the way, uh, if, if, if you want like a slightly more produced version of the Yale interview, you can go listen to an episode of this American life <laughs> that he did with Casey Newton. It's uh-huh. a good one. <laughs> they're, they're, good. I, I, like, again, he's very compelling. I'm glad he was on stage. I'm glad that audience, which, you know, is a very powerful, influential audience, like heard it. Mm-hmm. I think that's important. But if you're Linda, there was nothing that you were reacting to that you had you hadn't already reacted to, right? Yeah, it was just like a very familiar. Like you, you see this kind of hostility sometimes from people who who don't want to give you the answers, and they they have their narrative, and they really don't want to deviate from that narrative, and that just seemed to be the case here. And I was like, okay, so I'm not gonna get necessarily something substantial from Linda, but I thought it was a very revealing. It, interview even if it wasn't like a substantial one like it was super revealing to me is there a scientific term for revealing nothing for like the substance of something to be nothing (laughs) press release (laughs) (laughs) Uh, no i think i mean to me the the 
she, even the things that she said, and this is the thing that has really stuck with me about the interview, is even the things that she said didn't seem like they were true. Like she named, uh, I think the number was 540 million monthly active users. And she said that, or not monthly active users, just users. Yeah. So whatever that means, she said that number twice. So I'm inclined to believe that is actually a number. But then <laughs> she said, she said, uh, Julia asked about how many daily active users X has, which is actually a really important number, right? Like we, there are a million external things saying X is not doing well, right? Like there are in engagement metrics that seem to be down that are all reported by third parties. So, you know, grain of salt with that. It's the people on the platform are experiencing. Right. It's way down on the app store. Like all of the vibes are bad, but the number of people who log into Twitter every day is like potentially the most important number. And I don't believe for one second that she doesn't know that number to like the decimal place. And instead she gets up and is like, oh, it's between 200 and 250 million people every day. And Julia followed up by saying uh, that it was 237 million when Elon Musk took it over. And then Linda said at 1.225. And there's just like, you don't have to tell anybody. You're a private company owned by one dude. At one point she pulled out her phone at one point, yeah. she pulled out her phone to as though she was going to check the number and then did not <laughs> and then showed the phone to the audience. And it was just her home screen. And a lot of sleuthing has showed that X was not on her home screen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a very confusing situation. And we just got a report this week about most of the big companies daily, like daily active users. And it was so far from that. I think Twitter was like 56 million. Oh, yeah. Twitter. Twitter's always again. I And I. I've said this many times, and I will say it again now very clearly for everyone to hear me. Criticism of, of Twitter or X's current leadership is in no way <laughs> praise for the previous administration. No, it's been bad the whole time. <laughs> yeah. They were bad. And actually, one of the most interesting things about it is you can make an argument that Twitter is so hard to run. It is such a mess that that version of bad was the only way to be like they had entered a steady state of horribleness but they weren't growing they weren't making any money they this is why they sold it to elon at an inflated share price because its board of directors had come essentially come to the conclusion that nothing they could do would ever bring the company to that share price on their own that is like if you look at the mirror <laughs> You know, like, you know, like every kid wakes up one day and like realizes like, I'm not going to pass okay. <laughs> like, I'm just not going to be a doctor. You know, like maybe that was just me. But like, you know, there's like those moments in your life where like, ah, I had better give up. Me and like, sports. Twitter as a company <laughs> was like, uh, we're never going to hit $44 a share. And they sold it to Elon. And like, again, I just don't want to say like criticism of this administration is praise it does not imply that they were doing they were doing a horrible job such that they quit yep just flat out they just quit they couldn't figure out how to do it on their own and they, and they sold it to elon because he showed up like a dummy to buy it but it's not that he's now put in place a team that will do a better job he's put in place a team a ceo who doesn't appear to know what's going on yeah i think to me like the the worst look for linda in this entire interview uh which is a fairly high bar in this particular interview was when Julia asked about uh, Musk's tweet about going to a fully subscription mm -hmm. model where everyone using Twitter would have to pay for Twitter. And uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but Linda was basically like, well, she first asked to repeat the question, which was bizarre. It was a very simple question. No, I don't say so I don't think that was bizarre. OK, I like like everybody is like, oh, she didn't know the answer. She didn't want to give the answer. Like, I think those are two very different things. Oh, sure. It was a total filibuster. Yeah. Yeah. She was straight up filibustering. Yeah. Like, like, let's let's give her a little a little acknowledgement <laughs> sure. of that, at least she was she was doing something. But then Julia rephrases the question and she says, I think she says, did he say that's what we're doing or that's what he's thinking about? And then Julia <laughs> said, yeah. he said, that's the plan. So at this point, it's now abundantly clear that Linda doesn't know what's going on. And and then she says, essentially, in response to another question, she says, we talk about everything and then has no more response. So I don't know how yeah. I'm supposed to come out of that not thinking that she didn't know I, this was a thing. 
I came out of that thinking she was filibustering and trying to make fun of Julia for asking the question at all. Oh, interesting. Like the way she looked to the audience after she was like, did he say that? Or And that's why I want to know, like, Neelai, you were there. Yeah. Being in the room, uh, Linda, the, I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> I was in that room all day. Yeah. And I would just say the comp, the room was packed. You know, a lot of things, if you ever go to a conference, like the, the composition of the room changes over the day because people right. are like networking or like doing it, whatever. I'm like, they're like doing work calls, whatever. Like this was packed and Linda got a lot of cheers, which. Like big cheers. I, I, Linda came yeah. with an entourage. <laughs> like, <laughs> like the, like the Apple employees so I, you hear cheering at an Apple event. This is like a small version of that. Yeah. Yeah, it was, there was just there was an element in there that was weird. And I will say this at the end, Julia got a standing ovation. <laughs> this is a real thing that happened at the end of code. Like she deserved the, it. The, the conference ends. Linda leaves. Casey and I walk back on stage. I literally said, holy shit. <laughs> and then I said, Julia Borston, everyone. And, and Julia got <laughs> oh, a standing great. ovation from that crowd. That's awesome. Uh, so, uh, you know, when I say the composition of the room was it was odd. But the people who were noisiest at the beginning were like the Linda sure. people. Yeah. Um, and so I think she thought the room was a lot warmer to her than it might have been. She played to the room a lot. She played to the room a lot because I think she had the sense the room was really, was like on her side. So she kept looking at the room as though everyone agreed with her that this was bullshit. Yeah. And that was not the case. And the one example of that, which was absolutely the funniest thing that I've ever seen happen at Code. And I've been, to, I've been going to this conference for a decade. Uh, she said, who wouldn't want Elon Musk by their side <laughs> running product? And like, there's just like, people just like burst into laughter. Did they start raising their hands? Because it's a room full of product people. <laughs> like, what did I say at the beginning? What did I want code to be? I wanted yeah. code to be about product. Who did we invite? Who did we put on the stage? Who did they bring? Product people. And they were like, no. And Julia was like, raise your hand. If, and like, everybody's <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I cannot believe, like, you don't know, like, you don't know this is a room full of product people. That was a yeah. brutal moment. Um, yeah. All right. That's enough of that. I could that. talk about this, by um, the way, for the, like, the, maybe the rest I know, which is precisely so why strange. it's enough of that. Let's, this is why I was like, I need to be the guest. Not the host. <laughs> yeah. That's, you, everybody should go. It's worth watching the whole interview. You're going to get three minutes in and your whole body is going to start to feel itchy because it is very uncomfortable. Uh, Imagine being in the yes. room. Yeah. It's like the first half of Never Been Kissed, which is the most excruciating movie. And then, just just to make it about me for one second, very important, imagine being like, I have to go back out on the stage half. Yeah, was holy shit a rehearsed <laughs> line? Had you like stood <laughs> backstage going, holy shit, holy shit. Like, yeah. That's on the teleprompter, <laughs> Casey actually. and I were just like holding hands. Like, what are we going to do? <laughs> That's great. But yeah, everybody, we'll put it in the show notes. You should go watch it. Go listen to it. It's it's really interesting. Um. Let's just blow through some of the actual, like, interesting product yeah. stuff that happened. To me, the Getty AI thing was one of the most interesting pieces of yep. the whole show. Do you want to just explain a little bit about that conversation and what we got from Craig Peters, the, the Getty CEO? Yeah, so we had two conversations back-to-back -back that I really wanted to make sure we had back-to-back. -back. It was Microsoft CTO Kevin Scott, who is wonderful, and the CEO of Getty, Craig Peters, who is a firecracker, <laughs> right? Which you wouldn't think for the Getty CEO, but like kudos. Yeah, but he's great. He's a creative. Yeah. Like he ba he manages thousands of photographers. Like it, once you like put that together, like, oh, you're like, oh, I get it. You know. Fair. So Getty is suing Stability AI, which makes Stable Diffusion, and the you know the, the lawsuit is what you think. It's whether training on copyrighted images is fair use. Stable Diffusion is like some. I don't I don't think think it does this anymore. But like for a while, it would produce the Getty watermark. In AI generated oh, images. Wow. And the idea is like, come on, right? So, you know, everyone thinks that stability is kind of a chaotic company. They refused to come on Sager Code. We'd invited them to, you know, respond to Craig and they they said no. It says a lot. Um, but you know, Craig's entire thesis was like, you can build AI tools that don't step on other people's copyrighted stuff. And in fact, we have. And so, you know, they they shut off their brand new product stuff at code. They shut off their brand new AI image generator, and we like had fun using it on stage. But his argument was this industry is stepping all over creatives mm. and like what Getty makes is important to history and we need to like protect it and we need to build business models that protect it instead of just like racing headlong into devaluing it even further. 
And the reason I said I put the interviews back to back is because my, Kevin Scott is an author. He's an artist. He's a maker. He is a Renaissance man. He's great. He can talk about anything. Microsoft has a $10 billion bet on it being fair use with OpenAI. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, that's crazy. And so, you know, Kevin was like, a lot of people think this is fair use. And I was like, not everyone. And then we brought out Craig, which was really <laughs> cool. So listen to those two conversations back to back. They're, you know, they're all going to up in the decoder feed and they'll be on the, the Verge YouTube. But that was the dynamic that I really put in front of everybody. Like the industry has not figured out this huge problem at the center of AI. And we had, you know, we had Warner Music CEO, Robert Kinsel on stage. He's a former uh, head of business at YouTube. Like I'm not on the side of the music industry very often. I'm not on the side of big copyright very often, but you see this dynamic and it actually like shuffles the decks a little bit. And the Getty conversation in particular, uh, I think really brought it to the fore because they're making some of the technology too. They want to show that you can make the technology in the right way, uh, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I thought that that bit that he showed where he was basically like, we're in this race with, you know, OpenAI and Anthropic and Google where everybody is trying to do the biggest possible thing, right? Like everybody brags about like the number of parameters in their model and how big the training set is. And it's like everything is supposed to be this gigantic all purpose thing for everybody, for everything, forever. Like AI is just Windows now, right? Like it's huge. Yeah. And then that was just why I thought Craig and the Getty stuff is so interesting because like we can take this smaller corpus of data that is better and we can actually make it work just as well, but more successfully for everyone involved. And I just think that's very cool. Yeah. And then somehow inside of that, there's one more piece, one more term that's super interesting in there. And somehow we will compensate the artists right. whose work is in the training data. And I was like, how? And he's like, we just are making <laughs> right. <laughs> like, yeah, he was very honest about like, we only have half the answers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he's like, right now we're basically doing it on popularity. <laughs> like if, if you're... It's like Spotify, the way Spotify works. Like this was too weedsy to get into on the, on the code stage. But the, the answer is like, we'll look at the proportion of images inside of the training data that people call up more often, like in the, in the, in the wider world of Getty. And then when people pay to generate images, we'll dole out fractions of a penny based on that sort of like underlying ranking, which is like, it is more like how Spotify works mm -hmm. than anything, but it is not some incredible complicated algorithm about what training pixels were put. It's, it's more like what's popular. You get more money, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. And like they're, they need to refine that. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that's right. Um, the other one, uh, Alex, you and I watched Casey Blois together. Mm -hmm. Uh, we did. What, what did, did we get anything from Casey that, that we thought was interesting? Casey Blois runs HBO. It's like a very important person. This happened right after the end of the writer's strike. So we had like new information. Mm -hmm. Peter Kafka interviewed him. They talked a little bit about that, a little bit about some other stuff. Like what, what, what did we get from Casey that you thought was interesting? We got the True Detective season four trailer. Which looks sick. Yeah. It's apparently very excited. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think I was like texting you like, this is my personality <laughs> yeah. for the next four months. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think we just got his, his reinforcement of David Zaslav's kind of way of thinking out there, right? Like he was talking a lot about how the the cable bundle was back and it was going to be on, on these streaming services and that like – he felt that was he, that was good, and and he wants to see that more. And and then they talked a lot about this new show, Naked Attraction, <laughs> just kept coming that's up. on HBO Max, which was like my my sister in law had just texted me the night before about it, and I'd never heard about it. And I was like, yes, <laughs> I know what he's talking about because I just googled this. Um, and and so he was kind of like defending the the way that they're choosing what they put on HBO and what they what they share as HBO versus Max versus Cartoon Network versus all HGTV and all of these other channels that are now part of of the larger streaming ecosystem. And yeah, it was it was mainly just like reinforcement of David Zaslav's kind of way of thinking. And that was nice. To, like it was interesting to see that because you're kind of like, well, how does how does someone like Blois think about it and Apparently, very similarly. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, Neil. What did you What did you take away from it? Uh, that I think Casey Bloys is maybe one of the most powerful people at Warner Brothers Discovery, and he knows it, and David Zaslav knows it. Fair. And mm. you know the the stuff about HBO versus Max. Like he was just very calm and comfortable with it. You know, I I, I saw Casey backstage and. I was like, do you want me to ask you some more questions about HBO Max versus Max? And he was like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, his his thesis, his argument was that HBO by itself has never been a successful business in the history of HBO. 
even when you think about people paying for HBO directly, he's like, people had a cable bundle and they would pay us extra money for HBO. And if we don't ride along with that cable bundle, that has never been a successful business for us. Is that a retcon? Maybe, you know, like maybe, but it is historically true. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's a new owner at the company and that is his thesis. That's very much has us love things like what people want is 90 Day Fiance. And then sometimes they want True Detective. It's not the other way around. Right. And that is, uh, I think probably Verchast listeners don't feel that way. But have, have you ever been to America? <laughs> um, <laughs> I like, I think that's I, honestly, I do think that's true right like like most people are watching the reason you like hbo and the reason you like those things is that like sunday night you go watch hbo but you probably weren't watching hbo every single night of the week when you were watching tv channels i mean you could have been but like that was a very small population of folks and they could kind of be insufferable right what are the dominant t like from the golden age of television in the bundle it's but it's a bunch of network tv series it's friends it's the office right like and they're still dominant which is crazy um so yeah, I, you know, there, there was that. He talked a lot about uh, HBO shows now appearing on Netflix again. And he was like, mm-hmm. uh, look, in you know, the brass ring used to be syndication and we need to go back there. And we went through this weird period where everyone was trying to build their own little monopoly. And we've like, we've realized like that's not the way. And I was like, I always knew that wasn't the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no one's told Netflix though. Right. Well, I, but that, Netflix is a different business. It's the only one that's successful, right? They, they fired like just cannon blasts of venture capital money into building yeah. their moat and everyone else tried to do it. And it like destroyed the industry along the way. Yep. Um, Casey did talk about the strike, by the way, and just speaking of costs going up and Peter asked him like, is the resolution of this strike and maybe the SAG strike going to bring your costs up? Uh, Cause your labor costs are higher. And he was like, no, which I think if I was in the writer's guild or the screen actor's guild, I'd be like, yeah, we told you so. Um, yeah. By the way, here's all the disclosures. Uh, <laughs> Our staff is unionized by the WGAE. Alex is in the WGAE. Uh, we Comcast is one of our investors. Linda Yaccarino doesn't like we me made very much. <laughs> we, we made a Netflix show. We made a Netflix show. I'm the EP of a Netflix show. Um, someone has asked us many times. That show is not because it's documentary. It was not covered. By evening, <laughs> what it? It's what? What do you want from me? <laughs> Me like so tired. The <laughs> I'm so tired. Um, all right, let's do. We're gonna. I want to talk more about the writer strike. We're gonna get to that in a little bit uh, because it, it's yeah. it's it ended in some really interesting ways. So we're gonna talk about that. Let's do two more just ultra fast things about code and then get out of here. Yeah. Uh, first, Neil, I, I am going to give you 65 seconds and no longer to talk about the Monarch Tractor CEO that you had on stage. Ready, go. <laughs> The most important interview I did at Code was with Provian Pimets of the CEO of Monarch Tractor. I'm surprised there wasn't a grill there, honestly. Like I opened that interview by saying the entire human species is utterly dependent on tractors. <laughs> and I saw Jake, like our deputy editor, Jake, just start cracking. He's like, oh, Neil has on his bullshit again. Uh, it's, it's true. It's a fact. Uh, Praveen just like blew the crowd away by talking about his tractor. So it's an EV tractor as a full sensor suite. They built it to be ultra modular. All this, the sensor suite is in the roof of the tractor, mm-hmm. which is just a handful of bolts and a couple cables for pow- power and data. And he's like, that is what we're going to upgrade. Like over time, we'll just sell you new roofs. Other people can have new roofs or, you know, they're the open ecosystem compared to John Deere. They're partnered with case Case is making tractors using their technology. Go watch it. He's like, we're, we're the Android. Like John Deere is the iPhone, closed, proprietary, hard to service. We're going to be the open ecosystem. And the tractor is cool. Yeah, his line was, we're becoming the Android of agriculture, which is just an unbelievably cool and vergy sentence. Love it. And I will tell you this. I've I've talked a lot about the crowd in this room. They loved him Mm. by the end of this. They were like, oh, tractors are the shit. Like one person was like, I'm going to buy a tractor for my vineyard, which is the code audience. Yeah, I, I I did a conference one time and basically just introduced a man and asked him, so 3D printing houses, huh? And he talked for like 20 uninterrupted minutes about all the cool <laughs> things you can do when you can 3D print concrete houses. And it was the most excited room I've ever been in. Like people love this stuff. It's awesome. The world runs on it. I agree. Yeah. Technology yeah. and products. I'm telling you, it's the, that's, it's, that's it's what it's the stuff. All about. Um, and then the other one was uh, Artifact Mike Krieger, which I think I continue to think Artifact is interesting, but it's like a little kind of tiny thing, but they just launched Twitter at Code, right? Like Mike Krieger was just like, we're doing yeah. Twitter. CEO, co-founder and co-founder of Instagram launches Instagram. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, it's like, I don't know what yeah. you want me to say. Like, uh, Krieger's great. He was literally coding, you know, Artifact's a tiny company. He was literally shipping code oh, wow. in my green room. That's awesome. Um, and he was like, this is so much better than being the Love big that. company. <laughs> Uh, so that was really fun. Uh, yeah, go look. At it. It's Twitter, right? It's posts. The only the only real difference is you have to have a photo for some reason. There's a lot of Instagram DNA coming through. But you know what? Uh, what what Mike Krieger has told me, what Kevin Systrom has told me, is they always launch Artifact with the goal of being something much bigger, with the goal of creating a much bigger corpus of machine learning data and doing more interesting things with it. And you can see they started with its links on the web. It's a recommendation engine for web pages to you can share links to now you can just share your own content and we will recommend that to you. And they are building, a, they're building sort of like an AI first social network. It's cool. And like, again, what, what, what am I hammering home here? Yes. There's the chaos. There was a lot of product conversation to code, like an awful lot of what products are we building? Why are we building them? What are the dependencies on NVIDIA, on GPUs, on other stuff that we need to overcome in order to build products. And to me, Mike was like the the yeah. pinnacle of that moment because he was literally building the product in the green room before he walked out <laughs> on stage. Yeah, he was great. Um, and then, okay, last one. You did not successfully get RJ Scaringe, the CEO of Rivian, to talk shit about the Cybertruck. But I would say he made fairly clear that he thinks the Cybertruck is stupid. Would you agree with that assessment? <laughs> yeah, you know, there's... Um, uh, the code name of decoder is Neilai versus media training. Uh -huh. You know, it's like, can I fight you to a draw? And like, sometimes I, I usually get to a draw. I think sometimes I win, and that's that's a whole new. And then the subsex CEO <laughs> gets in trouble. Yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. Like, so, sometimes I win too much, honestly. Um, uh, but it's like fine. It's, it's a game, and that's why CEOs come and do it because they're all Type A, and it's it's you know it's a game that's set up to. To, to be winnable, like not to be unfair, but you know, you know, the questions are coming. And the reason I bring all that up is sometimes I can see the media training and the most devastating answer you can give inside of the media training is, well, that's a choice. <laughs> <laughs> right. as, as, as allowable answers go, that is the most damning one. Yeah. Right. It's like, yeah, people are free to make that choice. <laughs> We'll see what the market decides. Like it's choice. it's a real like bless their heart kind of response. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like if you know what that means, <laughs> you're like uh, the one piece of news that's inside of there uh, that was important, and I, I hope sort of the EV community caught this. I asked him about the deal terms to use the Tesla charger because Rivian's using NACS two, and he said everyone thinks there's some like complicated data sharing agreement. There's these conspiracy theories out there, and there is not. There is an agreement to use a charger and there is agreement to give us access to their network. And that's it. Yeah. So, yeah, there you go. I don't know what it's like for everybody else, but he was like, like everyone else, we thought the charger was better to use. The Biden administration did its thing. It's like some tax scheme that requires them to basically open up their network. And then everyone rushed in to use the charger in the network because the conditions were there for us to go make a deal on not onerous mm -hmm. terms. Yeah, fair enough. It was good stuff. There's a ton of good stuff coming out. We're going to have a lot more. It'll be on the YouTube channel. It'll be on podcasts all over the network i did ask him about the the single wiper it's a choice yeah, that's what to ask. is that where he said bless your he heart was, he, yeah that was that was the second <laughs> it's a choice i was like do you think this triangle is going to destroy your business and he was like i don't know man don't no thank you <laughs> i was like what about one big wiper and he was like many people have made to say like it's great you can have as many wipers as you want elon <laughs> All right, we need to take a break and then we're going to come back and Alex and I are going to tell Neil about everything else that happened this week. We'll be right back. All right, we're back. Let's get to the other news of the week. Alex, I'm going to give you the choice. Do you want to do the writer strike first or do you want to do MetaConnect first? Ooh, I kind of want to do MetaConnect first. I think both are really important, but I want to talk about some gadgets. All right, let's do Meta. Um, three big things from MetaConnect, big annual hardware event, the Quest 3 headset, the new smart glasses, and the just weird slew of AI, AI stuff. Yeah. Uh, let's start with the headset. So, <laughs> well, you don't want to start with T Pain. I'm not. I'm not ready for T Pain. <laughs> I need like a minute before we get to T Pain and Snoop Dogg Snoop and Dogg Dwayne Wade Mexican. pretending to be not Dwayne Wade. And I don't understand what any of that. Actually, you know what? Let's do that right now. I'm angry. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. It's like, Alex, do you want Tom Brady in your house not being Tom Brady? I don't. Yeah. Alex, will you just will you just explain what Meta is doing with all these chatbots? Well, they assume you don't have any friends and that you need <laughs> artificial intelligence to be chat like your friend. Basically, it's a bunch of chatbots, but the chatbots are designed to look and sound like famous people. So there's like a Snoop Dogg dungeon master 
that they he tried to demo on stage it didn't work um that was kind of unfortunate and, and that's basically the gist of it right like they, these chatbots are meant to just replicate people and build these like enhance those parasocial relationships you already have with celebrities and i really 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 encourage you to make more friends <laughs> so i'm sorry that's mean but let like, me offer you the flip of this okay so i was reading casey's newsletter last night uh, and he was writing about the new version of ChatGPT, which can actually speak to you. Mm -hmm. like, you can play these characters. It's multimodal, whatever. Um, and he had this example in here, which I had not really considered. But he's like a teenager, a young trans teenager, wrote into Hard Fork and was like, I get affirmations every day from GPT. Like, it's the thing that I talk to Aww. on this, like, right? And I and that's an earlier version. So yeah. I there's I, And his whole newsletter is basically like, we're on the cusp of this being these relationships being realer and like there's all the Silicon Valley baggage. There's all the endless conversation with the movie, her, all that stuff is in there, but he's like, there's something here that is worth paying attention to. And that kind of unlocked my brain when I was reading it. I like that. I don't know that I want to be talking to T-Pain about, <laughs> you know, like, but there's something in what there. you just described is kind of the story of community on the internet since the beginning of the internet, right? Like actually, wait, I want to take this back. Okay. I want to be talking to T-Pain now that I've, I'm very tired. <laughs> But I just want it to be actual T Pain. T Pain rules. Like I just like there's no. You should watch this podcast. He's amazing. Yeah. No. T Pain is great. But no. I think the the question of like where is your community on the web is a really interesting and important one, and is mm -hmm. one people have been talking about for 25 years, right? Like you go back far enough, and there were people who were like, "Oh, these kids are talking to other people online. That's bad." And we've like come to realize that that's like you, those relationships are real. And you, that stuff is real. And then it turns again once it's an AI thing. And I think that changes the calculus a little bit. But th there are versions of that that are good and valuable and useful. I just think this thing Meta is trying to do, which is not like build tools that are good and useful and sort of human, but like make a thing that looks like Dwayne Wade that will like help me do th or like Snoop Dogg can be the DM for my Dungeons and Dragons games or like random celebrities will help me cook. Like that to me feels like the uncanny valley of all of this, where it's just like, we're, we're not anywhere with that. To me. Yeah. Yeah. I think what left me kind of like cold on it. Cause I do think right now I'm trying to play Dungeons and Dragons for the very first time ever. And apparently it is very hard to get a bunch of people coordinated in a room. So like <laughs> apparently that Snoop Dogg thing is actually really, really good. If you play Dungeons and Dragons, that seems like a really compelling thing. But uh, it just felt a lot like when, when Alexa started doing the voices, it felt, it feels like, like it, it just hit me that same way of like, this feels like the technology is not ready yet. So we're having to put like a celebrity layer on top of it to yeah. get you to engage. Well, this is like the meta thing. It's like we launched threads. Here's a bunch of celebrities. <laughs> and, and then, yeah. and they've been backing into the, the func the real functionality that will make mm -hmm. it successful or not. I, I think that's this too, right? Yeah. It's, what you want is I want to talk to Tom Brady. I don't think anyone's ready, let alone Tom Brady, for like, you can just talk to me whenever <laughs> right. you want. Right. And that's dangerous if you're a celebrity in a lot of ways, like whatever. But hey, come play a character and give life to a character that you can talk to with some personality. I, I think that's very safe. For, it's just playing a role, yeah. right? Uh, and to Meta's credit, like there's a big, there's like big K-pop groups that already do this where you can go talk to an AI and it's, it's like programmed to kind of be like the 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 K-pop star you like, um, so so it's out there. This stuff exists already. Yeah, I just I quickly learned it's not for me. K-pop is always on the bleeding edge of being really <laughs> yeah. weird. Also, Alex, if right? you just spoke A-pop as AI pop into existence, I'm going to be furious. <laughs> with you. AI pop, it's coming. All right, go watch. It's, we have it on our site. It's in a quick post. Yeah. You can, it's on. Yeah. T-Pain's Instagram yeah. or it's on T-Pain's TikTok. Go watch the video. It's a very But strange. I do think the more interesting piece of the AI thing is the is the meta AI chatbot that they're putting out and putting into mm -hmm. basically all of their messaging platforms. You'll be able to get it mm -hmm. everywhere you use meta products. And it's essentially chat GPT. Like they're just turning on chat GPT inside of meta products. No, it's, oh, it's uh, chat GPT is open AI. They've turned, this is their own Yeah, model. but it's like functionally, right, 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 it's, it's yeah. the same. Like yeah, the, yeah. the goal and is they, the same. They think it's better. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's better. I don't know if it's better either. I'm sure it will have We've many of the same We've heard some people say it is. 
we've heard some people say it isn't we'll just have yeah. to find out yeah yeah and they're big on llama which is their large language model like there's the this this sort of three-headed triangle now like amazon just made this big investment in Anthropic, they're going to do some really interesting stuff over time. Uh, Microsoft and OpenAI are obviously together. Google is doing its own thing, and now Meta is doing its own thing. And like this race is getting real and really expensive and really high stakes for all four of these companies really fast. It's yeah. really interesting. And they're doing art generation too. It's not just it's not just words. Like there's going to be a bunch of stickers where you can just like make something up and do that. And that I'm actually very excited about because like. The possibility for trolling my friends is extraordinarily high when I can just make <laughs> AI generate horrible yes. art for me. Wait, can I say some yeah. like deeply diverged chassis thing about that? No. What is a sticker? <laughs> what is a sticker? <laughs> the reason that stickers and memes and reaction gifs and all that stuff is powerful is because they have shared yep. meaning. Yep. Right. So like you, you're like, here's a GIF and like it means something and it carries layers and layers of meaning when you share it with a friend in response to something else. I'm going to AI generate some stuff for you. Yeah. Uh, de novo, like over and over again, does not carry that meaning. It's just you talking. It's just you being like, I made up words. You say that. But if you make a horrible enough one, <laughs> it can be a beam. No, it's true. It, it's just like I, I don't want to. There's a part of this where it's like endlessly customizing everything actually detracts from how we communicate. Yeah, it fractures the, it fractures the communication. It, at the dumbest level, it's like now I have to explain all my jokes to you. Mm. Like I made up a joke and I have to explain it to you instead of repeating it or riffing on a thing that already exists. Is I know I know we got some PhDs in our audience <laughs> who are full of this information. Our, our co-founder uh, and friend, Dieter Bone, Deep into semiotics, like the, the meaning of meaning, the, it, this is it. It's like right in there. It's like, what if the AI is making up ways for you to communicate that the person on the other end has no context for? Yeah. And, but like, it, it's stickers. Like, it, it's yeah. fine. <laughs> People aren't going to use them. That's what I'm trying to get at. It's like, if you don't, if you don't get to free ride on the history of meaning, like the stickers are just silly stickers. Yeah, I mean, that's, there's yeah. a big, giant like huge cultural question in all of that, right? This everything is becoming endlessly personalized versus we need things that everyone understands in order to communicate about them, which is why the office is so useful. I realized the other day that like <laughs> most of the screenshots in on my phone are gifts from the office that I just use for infinite purposes all the yeah. time. There's a, why are you the way that you are gif that I just use 50 times a day <laughs> and people understand it. It's great. It's very helpful. Yeah. Um, Okay. Do you know those people whose entire personalities is movie quotes? Yeah. Like they're not going to be out there generating <laughs> stickers. You know? Yeah, that's very true. They're a dying breed because we don't yeah. share that. Cult. Like everybody watches their own things now. So that shared culture is is, is dying down to Barbie movie, which is great. <laughs> Barbie movie is wonderful. But like. You're saying people don't run around quoting out. Oppenheimer to each other all day? That's not. Yeah. Why not? not? What's up with that? I am become deaf. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I'm just going to start sending that to the Verge staff every day. <laughs> I uh, love it. Um, <laughs> Alex, tell me about the Quest 3. Tell Neelai about the Quest 3. We've been wondering about this thing. We kind of knew what it was. Uh, Neelai, it's cool. It's... It looks bananas. <laughs> like, I, I was looking at the photo of Addy wearing this thing, and I was like, I don't know, man. I love it. Like, we were talking about this in, in Slack the other day, and people were like, I hate it. It looks alien. And I'm like, that's exactly why I love it, because it looks kind of alien. It's got It's got these three, like, little ovals on the front. And they look kind of like the iPhone 10 camera module. So it looks like they slapped three of those on there, which feels very like old fashioned and kind of, oh, yeah, I've seen that before. But then and this somehow is, well, this is in the service of room tracking of pass. Yeah, yeah. It's got it's it's five hundred dollars. It's got dual 2064 by 2208 pixels. So it's a much higher resolution than, than the previous one, which was only 1832 by 1920. Like it's going to be a little sharper. And it's got the the second generation of the Snapdragon XR2 processor in it. And that's where a lot of the big stuff changes. So I think like probably the most notable thing and the thing that, that Addy talked about in her hands-on was that the graphics are better on this thing. Like it's 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 things are sharper. Um the resolution's a little higher. Sean was very excited. No one else has this frame of reference because zero people bought a Quest Pro. Mm -hmm. But I, I have one. Is it better than the Quest Pro or worse than the Quest Pro? Because Quest Pro is pretty good. Probably about better. The software is disaster, but the hardware. It's yeah. From a from a pure like display 
quality perspective, it's better than the Quest Pro. Really? Um, it's actually, it's the highest res thing they've made, uh, including the Quest Pro. The The ongoing existence of the Quest Pro does not make any sense. And I think... I, so what we should note here uh, is that Alex Heath interviewed Zuckerberg on our site. He did. For, he in did. the decoder feed. Uh, and I think he asked for the Quest Pro and Zuck was like, yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> It's like we just had a bunch around. <laughs> we had to ship them. Yeah. <laughs> but no, it's very clear that this is the one that Meta yeah. would like to sell you. I mean, Zuckerberg kept saying, and even uh, Andrew Bodsworth, the CTO, afterwards kept saying, this is the first mainstream mixed reality headset. Like, that is their phrase, right? And they're coming after Apple's Vision Pro in a really big way. They made a bunch of jokes about how it doesn't have a cable or a battery pack, um, yeah. which is honestly like a really good burn of the Vision Pro. Uh, yep. It's also not $3,500, so that's good. Um, but that is that is the pitch that they are making. They're like, this is the one. It's not finished. This is not where we're ultimately headed. Ultimately, where we're headed, I think they think, is, is these smart glasses, which we should also talk about. But this is the one that is for regular humans now. Yeah, it's the end of this form factor, right? Or like the best version of this form factor you can get right now. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think they continue to struggle to make the case for why people would want this like a lot of what they talked about was video games they have more games they have better games there's stuff to do but then they occasionally just throw in you know meta quest for business but don't really explain that they're just like you can have it if you want it for business that's that's all we know about that uh that was and that part was brutal. they talk a little bit about it as an entertainment device which i think is interesting like they they show the same screenshot that everybody shows which is just like you can watch instead of watching one nba game you can watch seven nba games on virtual screens yeah and that is like extremely want. my shit but like i didn't get the sense that there is some sort of brand new life-changing use case for this it just seems like between pass through better screens and just sort of an overall better experience of using the thing. That's great, though. I just want to be like going from the iPhone 3GS to the iPhone 4 and getting a Reddit, retina display is like great. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And and I've a bunch of us got a demo of this. Um, I mine was relatively short, but I still got to play a couple of the games and stuff. It is, I mean, leaps and bounds better than the Quest 2. Like the the pass through is is not perfect. It's a little sort of it's a little sort of warpy like. The floor was moving a little bit. But it's better than the Pro. Oh, better than the Pro. Way better than the Quest 2, which is like black and white and essentially doesn't actually work as pass-through. Yeah. Um, not as good as the demo I got at the vision of the Vision Pro, but that was super controlled. Who knows what that'll be like in real life. Uh, but yeah, this is a massive improvement over the Quest 2. Whether it will make people who didn't care about headsets care about headsets, to me, is still the open question, right? Like, that's what I don't know. But if you're a person who cares about headsets, gigantic upgrade. I kind of think it didn't sell itself well enough like like talking to Addy talking to you talking to people who got to actually try the thing was much more compelling than to me than watching the actual keynote about the product I think this is going to be true for every VR headset including the Vision Pro forever yeah and well that's just very interesting to me because Addy like told me about it and she's like oh yeah the pastor is way 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 better and I was like oh dang I kind of want it just for that that sounds really cool and then I don't see any of that on stage and I'm like well, I'm glad Addy told you. It really is. One of the great <laughs> unsolved problems of VR is how to show someone what you're seeing in VR in a way that looks at all compelling. Because your options yeah. are either like show it on the two screens, one's for each eye, which just doesn't make any sense to anybody. Or you just show it like a like slightly low res television. <laughs> it's like this doesn't mean anything yeah. to anybody. Uh, and I I've been hearing this from people in this space for like damn near a decade now that they're like, when we put this on someone's head, they get it. Uh, yeah. and until you put it on someone's head, it is so hard to explain what it is about it that works. And I think that's real. The only things I've ever seen, you know, there's people who play Beat Saber and they mm -hmm. fill entire green screen yeah. rooms. And so like they, they're doing like real life overlays. Yep. They, everyone's just got to do that. That's, that's my feeling. But the problem it's is like so many things are like sitting and using a computer, like quest for business is like. <laughs> Now you'll use Excel. And it's like, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, very large Excel. And the price doesn't, I think the big problem is the price doesn't help. Like one of the reasons the Quest 2 was so compelling was you're like, wow, I can get this for $300 when it was first announced, right? And they've now dropped that price back down to $300 after like a brief time of increasing the yeah. price. Mm -hmm. And so little, little wave there. And 
that was really compelling. Like I went out and bought it the day it was announced because I was like, that price is so low. I didn't get the $300 one. I spent more money. But I was still like, wow, I'm getting such a deal. This is great. And then this one is still $500. That's the same price as a PS5 or an Xbox. Yeah, this is very hard to justify as an impulse purchase at Christmas the way that I think a lot of Quest 2s got sold. Yes. It's sort of like, what tech present am I buying the I kids right. for Christmas? Because it was like it, that uh, the lower number. And I think that's going to harm adoption because because of that fact that you have to put it on, you have to try it, or you have to know somebody who has to <laughs> really be compelled by it. Like, or if, it, actually, I, I think what makes it even harder is it's like not a console generation, right? It's not a PS4 to PS5. A lot of people have Quest 2s because of what happened last Christmas and the Christmas before it. And it's like, oh, that's just sitting on yeah. the shelf. Yeah. Although I don't know, I think this one is going to be a little bit tough because I think the the Quest 3 is going to make the Quest 4 a console generation because what it's going to do, like everybody's mm-hmm. going to spend the next year building actually usable mixed reality stuff because for the first time it's worth doing. Like the pass through stuff is good enough. And the Vision Pro. Right. There. And so we're, we're now going to get to a point where there is an actual generation of stuff to do that takes advantage of this tech. Whereas right now it's like, a lot of the reason for the mixed reality is, and they even pitch it this way so that like I can find my coffee cup or look at my phone without taking my headset off, which is useful. It's a bad reason to buy a product. And so uh, (laughs) there just hasn't, they need the thing and that will come and it can come now, which is really exciting. But I think it's going to make, it's going to make the selling point for next year's model much easier, but I don't know how much it does for like right now. Yeah. Do you think it'll be next year's model or do you think they'll wait a few years? That's the problem is I don't think they're I think they're still at console level, not at phone level in encouraging upgrade cycles. That could be true. And I think if they release a new one next year, it's just going to be like, well, why? Like, at what point do I actually invest in this very expensive thing that isn't always reliably backwards compatible that is like growing each year by these leaps and bounds? Shouldn't I just wait until next year? Shouldn't I just wait until next year? Shouldn't I just wait for another price drop? Uh, but I think they need to be a little more thoughtful about how they're marketing this thing and, and pricing it. But I still also kind of want one. Yeah. Yeah, that's about right. And I think that's like the best case scenario for them. Yeah. It's like Christmas. Somebody gives me like a little Best Buy gift card. I'm like, yeah. Somebody wants to kill me 500 bucks. You know, maybe I'm not a Christie. <laughs> Spend it. Spend it, not yeah. on Legos. So, but I do think, I, I like, think yeah. it, it seems clear that what Meta did here was say, uh, we have to stop building the best possible cheap thing and just build a thing that's really mm-hmm. good and then charge what we have to. Uh, I think Apple yep. went the same route to like the nth degree, but meta has been on this path and like snap has been doing this and others have been doing this where they're like these things have to be cheap they have to be impulse buys you have to be able to buy them for christmas uh, and we're going to make them as good as we can and they'll get better and better over time and that hasn't really worked because it's still not possible to make a really good one for that price uh i don't have any reporting to back this up but i would bet good money that this hardware is not going to be earth shatteringly high margin for meta Uh, These things are expensive to build and hard to build. And I think Meta was smart to say, like, this is the bar for what quality is. And we just have to charge what it costs to build this and let that get cheaper over time, as opposed to like hoping quality goes up over time, because that I just don't think has worked so far. Yeah, it looks cool, though. And this is, by the way, we should talk about the Heath interview with Zuck. Zuck makes this point, right? Like making things smaller and cheaper is actually very hard. Um, and he, he, there's a, we should, we can even watch the, we should go watch the whole thing. It's great. But we have a TikTok up where he's like, people are impressed by the pyramids, but it's actually small things. Are more <laughs> <impressive>. <laughs> it's the beginning of his history channel show. <laughs> yeah. All the small things. Uh, one more thing I, I, I want to bring up out of the Heath interview. The Heath interview is great. Uh, Mark is super loose, uh, super relaxed, uh, talks a lot about building products. Actually, he's relaxed about two things. It's building products. He's like back in builder mode and he's like, this is what's great. Like the last few years I've needed to be like this first amendment yeah. scholar statesman person, but like now I'm building shit again and he can tell how loose. And then he's super loose when he talks <laughs> about beating people up. <laughs> so loose. <laughs> loves uh-huh. it. Just loves hitting a guy. Yeah. Um, uh, and that's like great. It's like, this is the most personality. Uh, he loves like MMA as a sport, not just like street <laughs> fighting. 
Just yeah. be clear. I'm very tired. <laughs> He's just out there punching um, people on the street. But he like talks about it and he talks about how the skill and discipline. And like you can see he's relaxed. Like he's back in his zone as opposed to Senator right. We sell ads. You know, like Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of talking about the quest three and building that and what they've learned and all this stuff. There's a lot of talking about building threads and how mm-hmm. excited that's made him. And one more confirmation that they are definitely going to decentralize and federate threads, which I think is really cool. Yeah, and he made the case you would hope he would make, which is that like we think that the future of social, we have to give people confidence that these things are going to be around. And it's like, yes, Mark, where have you been for 20 years? <laughs> <laughs> right, he's like, we've thought about doing a Facebook, and yeah. Facebook is too complicated. So you have to do it from the beginning, which is and like, yeah. cool. True. You know? Like, I think that's we'll, a we'll re- see. like re-architecting Facebook for activity pub is probably not possible. It's just, yeah. Yeah. Can we talk about the coolest part of the meta connect? Was it how ripped Mark Zuckerberg was? I said it like (laughs) three times as we were sitting watching the live stream. Like I cannot believe how shredded this dude is. Yeah. Like we, I think we were all just quietly slacking each other. Just being like, yo, wow. Yeah. But it was the glasses. The glasses were something that I think, Hearing about them, it, it was the opposite of the Quest 3. Somebody would tell me about the Quest 3 and I'd be like, oh, that sounds really, really cool. But I'd watch the demo and I'd be like, that's eh. And then this one, I'd watch the demo for the glasses and be like, eh. And then they talk about the glasses and I was like, actually, these these sound cool. Like, I want these Convince glasses. Me. I have been back and forth on this a million yeah. times. Smart glasses to me are either a thing that everyone should have immediately or an objectively stupid idea that just should not mm-hmm. exist. And I genuinely go between them well, 10 times a day. Convince me they're cool. Yeah, I, I do too, because I have to wear glasses and I don't want to go like get new lenses for these $300 frames, which is probably the same price as most frames anyway. Like that price isn't that different, but they, they were good looking. And then the woman that did the presentation for him was like, oh, had yeah. such good energy. <laughs> she was so excited to be there and talk about these glasses that I was like, are they really awesome? These yeah. seem awesome. And I think it was like the camera. It was just like the, the, the way the cameras work. The camera is much higher quality than it has been previously. I don't think I, I can't think of a practical use case for these glasses because they, they've got the, they got the audio in them. So, so you'll be able to hear stuff and you'll be able to like use your phone to ask it. You can ask it questions and the, the responses will pop up on your phone. And that seems like kind of cool and moving towards that mixed reality thing. And then it's got the, the, the cameras that will that will yeah. like stream to threads and stream to to Instagram and do all of that and that seems really really cool and I don't think I actually want to be that connected to other people <laughs> but at the same time part of me was like but don't I, I? so th- this is actually the exact tension that I have been feeling too and Neil I, I've been wondering all week about you because I remember when you first had a kid one of the things that you did Mm -hmm. pretty quickly was buy a point and shoot camera because you were like, I want to take a lot of pictures. I want to document a lot of stuff, but I don't want to have my phone in front of my face all the time for lots of obvious reasons. And that is the exact use case that all of these companies make for smart glasses. Like there are kids in the demo reel for Mm -hmm. every single one of these, right? Because like you can have both hands, you can swing your kid around, whatever, but you, you are less, there's not so much of a thing between you and especially not a thing that is otherwise trying to grab your attention. Well, there's one thing between you and your kid. You're wearing <laughs> sunglasses. There's that. Yeah, you, you can, can get, get them, them with in prescription regular lenses. Frame. Like, I'm you, just saying. You don't need tent. There's like, you can get there's, transition there's lenses. Thing. My dad wears transitions. <laughs> They're fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your dad and like every fourth grader who just got their first pair of glasses. I was that child. That boy was me. Uh, it was not cool, my friends. It's everyone, someone please go to fourth grades across the country and tell these children. This is Joey Slater that I will not tolerate. Sorry, Dad. I had an adult person <laughs> try to help me to get transition glasses recently. No, it's fine. Once you've like a- achieved in life, yeah, I see. Okay. okay, you can have transition lenses. That's what that was. That was the case made to be. They're like, no, no, you're, you're, you, you can do it now. You're an adult. Yeah, it's like your children are at the house, you're married, you got a grandkid, you're like, yeah, just take a load off, bro. Just have sunglasses ready to go. When you're in fourth grade, it's not, just tell the children. They're just gray all the time, these little kids in gray lenses. Uh It was a weird 1980s in Wisconsin. Anyway, uh, uh, yes, this is the argument. The problem is the camera's not any good. My RX100 is a great camera. That's why I bought it. My iPhone is a extremely complicated philosophical quandary of a camera. That's why I have it. 
this is like, I'll have it. I'll get my hands back, but I'm going to take shittier photos. But these are 12 megapixel. Uh, who doesn't love yeah. 12 megapixel single non HDR I mean, photos? People love it more than five megapixels, which was the previous one. That's true. And that's true. I haven't seen the photos, but that's always, yeah. to me, it's like, you know, what's the, the phrase? The best camera is the one you have with you. I always have an amazing camera with me. Your glasses. Right? I, I, my glasses. My transition <laughs> lenses. Uh, no, I know. I, my phone's around, you know. And yeah. I, I bought a really nice camera so I could divest myself of the phone. But I don't think having a more convenient camera. You know, it, I don't. Maybe, maybe. I haven't seen the photos. I haven't, like, used the thing. Again, blind reacts to the, the, the Ray-Ban glasses. But, you know, I I don't know. Like, it's it's more technology. And when I was, what David, to your point, right. I was after less. Right. Yeah, and I think, I think to me, like, it's very clear that Meta does not see these smart glasses as, like, the end point of smart glasses, right? Like, at the end of Connect, yeah, Mark yeah. Right. Zuckerberg got up and did the, like, almost sort of Steve Jobs impression of like, you know, when he was like, it's a widescreen iPod, it's a phone, it's an internet communicator. And he was like, he showed it. He was like, we have the Quest 3 headset. We have all this AI communication stuff. And then we have smart glasses. And the case he made is that like the end state of this is that the first two things, the Quest and the, uh, the AI stuff are going to end up in the glasses, right? Like he's like, this is the form factor yeah. and we're going to all this stuff into it over time. And, I don't know how long that's going to take or if that's ever going to happen, but I believe them that that's the vision. And I think the question we've been asking for a bunch of years now is like, is there anything interesting along the way? And to me, just purely from a personal perspective, the cameras don't do anything for me, partly because I think the like real world creepiness factor is still really real. And I don't, I don't know how to sort through that even. Yeah. It's just like, even just like walking around, like if you just walk around a city, just hold, holding up your phone like you might be taking a picture you're gonna creep people out right it's like whether or not you're actually doing anything it feels bad and so i have not sorted through how to deal with that yeah but i do think the uh the thing i'm most excited to see about these glasses is whether the mic and headphones are good because it's essentially they're trying to do this like personal audio speaker thing where you can hear it but nobody else can it has five mics in the glasses including one on your nose that's supposed to do a better job of picking up your voice which makes sense it would if that works, that's pretty cool. Uh, I don't like being a person who wears AirPods all the time. I would like to be a person who wears AirPods less. Uh, <laughs> and so if that's the kind of thing that I can use, like if I'm out on a walk or whatever, that's compelling to me. But also like it's whatever, it's 250 bucks. Am I going to buy? I don't wear glasses anyway. If I already wore glasses, yeah. I think I would be slowly talking yeah. myself into this. But as somebody who doesn't otherwise wear glasses... That's a big leap. So that's why I'm like, ooh, like maybe I should get a pair of these the next time I go get my prescription updated. I mean, a pair of Wayfarers is like $165. You're not that far away to add all this other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, like my glasses are already super expensive. I mean, we're all learning an important lesson about the amount of margin contained in <laughs> yeah. a pair of Wayfarers. Yeah, it's... Maybe this is going to drop, start dropping the prices of regular glasses. Yeah. I only buy $20 sunglasses because I lose them. And I think I've, I just realized I came to my own conclusion. I bought one nice pair of sunglasses. And I said, if I lose these within a year, I'm never allowed to buy nice sunglasses again. I lost them in three days. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't, they're just gone. And so now I buy, I buy $15 sunglasses like four times a year. It's great. I bought prescription sunglasses. I have had them 10 years. The prescription's no longer accurate, but I still have Perfect. the glasses. <laughs> but they look sick. <laughs> I probably shouldn't drive with them. It's fine. I will just say this. here. You know, everyone thinks this is a form factor. Apple thinks this is a form yeah. factor. Mm -hmm. uh, what the most compelling applications that are being built in the space are all virtual reality applications. Even yeah. Apple, right? When you look at their demos, it's like you're courtside at the NBA or like there's a dinosaur eating you or whatever. They're all VR applications. There are no compelling mixed reality or AR applications yet. Because they haven't figured out the privacy aspect of it, right? Well, sure, but they, they just, they, they can't even demo. Even my demo, my killer app, I will pay any amount of money for it, right? Just show me people's names. I was just at this conference and the amount of time I spent squinting at people's badges, <laughs> which is just really a weird thing to do. Yeah. Uh, by the way, if you're ever hosting a conference, make the names bigger on the badges. That's my one note. And now that I'm a conference host. Good call. 
Well, the font sizes next year are going to be bananas. It's, it's out of control. Um, it's huge. Everyone's going to carry around like yard signs with their name on them. Uh, this is my killer app. This is the thing I want the most. Faces and names. It's incredibly difficult to do in a privacy-centric way. You might have to build a, a worldwide facial recognition database. All very hard. Even that, right? Th th it's not built because of those problems. But it's the killer app for AR. No one can do it. All of the ones they're building along the way are VR. Mm -hmm. And that is in conflict with our belief about what the form factor will be because you have to block out the world in to do VR well. And a pair of glasses do, does not, by definition, does not do that. And I was having dinner with a friend at the conference and they're like, oh, yeah, but we'll just like do the things on the sides. <laughs> And I'm like, what kind of like Mad Max like bullshit are you trying you to sell like, me right now? Gonna, no, you look you just look like you had cataract surgery. No, like, that you're gonna look like Will I Am in a like an early 2000s like, music video. Like, no, 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 no. It's a bad look. <laughs> Don't do that. So like, I'm just saying, like all of the best applications that we're building are VR applications, and everyone thinks the form factor will will make those applications go right. away. Yeah. Unless you solve this like block out the world problem and like. I don't, that's weird. There, there's a tension there that I think, like you said, David, we're figuring out if there's anything interesting along the way. The thing that's interesting to me along the way is the absolute tension between what's, why you would put a computer on your face and the form factor of whatever it wants that computer to be. Or has to be, right? We're very much in the yeah. like, yeah. you know, 1990s desktop tower PC thing where the only version of it weighs a thousand pounds and has to live yeah. on your wood office max setup. Please keep sending us your old desk setups. We love them so much. So We're going to make a coffee table book. I want to be clear about this. This is I my goal. It's idea. a coffee table book called Computer Rooms. It's going to be a massive bestseller. I yeah. can already tell. Uh, and then we're going to retire and we're going to buy a boat. And that boat will be called the Computer Room. And I've just been thinking about this I love plan. it. I love it. All right. We need <laughs> to take time. one more break. And then we're going to come back. We're going to talk about the writer's strike real quick. And then we're going to do a little lightning round. And then we're going to get out of here. We'll be right back. All right, we're back. Alex Krantz, tell us about the end of the writer's strike. It ended this week kind of out of nowhere, it seemed like. Uh, well, we, we knew we knew that negotiations seemed to be reaching a conclusion. Everybody was starting to get kind of excited about whatever contract was coming. Contract is out now. The, the guild still has to vote on it. So both the writers, Guild of America East and West, both of them still have to vote on it. Everybody's still reading over it. They released a summary Tuesday mm -hmm. night, and then they, the next day they released the actual contracts. So you can go, and if you want to, you can go pour through the whole thing. Um, we, we have like a, a little summary of it up on the website as well. And there's a lot of big stuff in it. They got almost everything they wanted as far as AI goes. So there's a lot of AI protections in it. You're not going to be able to go ask AI to come up with a plot and then take that to a writer and make a writer write it. And then you keep the the rights to that story. You're not going to be able to do that. The The writer will maintain the rights to the story because AI generated content cannot have rights uh, according to this contract, um, which is probably good. Right. And that, that, I think that was really exciting. I know I spoke to a few, few writers who were really, really excited about that part of it and excited to just have that protection to, that helps maintain the status quo. And then the thing that's really going to change the status quo is the data. There's now going to be data that the Writers Guild is going to receive from these streamers, like Netflix, Amazon, all these people who have been super, super opaque about their data. Uh, they're not going to be able to be opaque with the Writers Guild itself. A lot of that data is not going to come to the rest of us because it's, you know, they still don't want everybody to know their numbers, but the Writers Guild will be able to release it in aggregate. And the fact that the numbers are even going to be out there just changes things. Like, it's a town. People talk. People have <laughs> yeah. to know those numbers. That seems like the bet, right? I was listening to an interview with Adam Conover, who's a, a writer who's on the negotiating committee for the, the Guild. And uh, I forget who he was talking to. I wish I could cite the podcast I was listening to. But he basically was like, if you reporters want the number maybe you should make a journalist's union and go fight with studios i don't care about you i'm trying to get numbers for my people uh, but then yeah. what he basically said is like between the numbers that are going to get reported to the guild and the fact that this business is shifting towards advertising like we're just going to start to know more it's they're yeah. just the numbers yeah. are going to be reported to more people people talk it's going to start to be out there in much bigger ways and i think that's true but it does seem like like there, there was some rubric they invented for like 
total hours watched of something. It's like we're we're still inventing the new numbers of what all of these things mean. Yeah, they're still new numbers, but I think because they're enshrined in a contract, they'll probably start to stabilize it as the new numbers, yeah. right? We talked about that on the podcast earlier this week and the numbers. They've always been fake. They've always been not real. Um, and everybody just agreed, okay, these not real numbers are the ones we're going to use. And so now we have new numbers that are probably the most realistic numbers we've had for for streaming or or broadcast television, if I'm being honest. like These, these are numbers that like are very, very trackable, very understood. And um, they're different. It's total hours of something streamed, I think, is is it. And that's like kind of goofy, but it's it's a real number, you know, it, but it does mean that like if 300 million people watch the first 15 minutes of something, that could be the same as if one person watches it 300 billion times, which is a real, yes. very real possibility because oh. there are some weirdos. Like Alex. I'm one of them. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. like me. <laughs> I have a speaking of K-pop fans, I have, a, I have an important piece of information. Yes. So one of our sponsors at Code was Illuminate, which formerly Nielsen Scan Scan. They do the Billboard charts. Mm -hmm. um, so I was talking to them, hanging out. It was really fun. They did a session, um, and they were talking about how they measure things. Did you know that at the platform level, if you stream something more than fifty times in a day, it doesn't count? <laughs> really? Because of K-pop, you just fans. tap out at fifty. Yeah. Yep, that's it. If, you, because, if you're more than 50 times a day, they're like, "That's you didn't do it. But do you get that's the 50? Either... I don't, it, I, that's proprietary. Interesting. Right? But like, if you talk to the people who measure things, Luminate, which makes the charts with mm -hmm. Billboard, uh, yeah, they're like, yep, there's a, at the platform level, we, like, K-pop fans are like our antagonists. <laughs> so everything you love, you can uh, only stream 49 times a day. <laughs> yeah, and then and then there's still some, like, algorithmic sure. renormalization well, and i think this is now coming this is my thesis like all yeah. over. whatever happens to the music industry happens to everybody else five years later this is now going to come to streaming television because if you're a writer or you have a fandom and there's going to be an aggregate number that everyone agrees on you're you're necessarily going to go try to gain that number right they i mean the, the fans already do that like if they right, think but, their but there's no transparency right right yeah, yeah yeah right right now it was kind of like we're working because it showed up in the netflix top 10 or we're working yeah. because some some company did analysis and said and boy to show 10. you up the netflix top 10 not guarantee you a goddamn yeah. thing nothing <laughs> canceled nothing. in the middle of the first episode <laughs> yeah but not only that i mean the platforms also have you know a hundred thumbs to put on the scale at any given time like the mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. what netflix chooses to show you in that big banner when you open the app is very meaningful yeah. and the top 10 is like very localized yeah. like the, here's the top 10 things in your house <laughs> it's the show that you were the right. ep of and you're like oh this is awesome. it's, it's always like, the shows FM. that they've already canceled yeah. yeah it's like alex do you want to watch a show we just canceled and i'm like i do and i hate you <laughs> uh so so yeah i, I like the, the the what what this contract this contract is straight up historic though also because like there were a lot of big price increases in it particularly around streaming streaming has not like Streaming is not lucrative if you're a writer, just straight up before this. It was not lucrative. You could barely make ends meet for the vast majority of people. And the the studios have gotten really good about gaming the system that existed to pay as little as possible. And this kind of ended a lot of that gaming. It's still going to happen. People are still going to get screwed out of money. That That is the nature of business. But but this, is, uh, this contract really put some really strong guardrails in, particularly around streaming, like... They were they were anticipating. I think it's like a twenty six percent increase in in revenue for writers of uh, streaming films that ha make that have a budget of thirty million or more. Mm -hmm. So all those really big Netflix, Apple TV films and stuff, where previously they probably weren't getting a lot of money for that, um, they're now going to be getting like at least a hundred thousand dollars, and uh, that's nice. That that seems nice to me. Uh, so so yeah, this is like. Very historic. SAG is still on strike, but there's a lot of movement there. People were kind of expecting this to be the way WGA goes. They get this really good deal. SAG is going to get a lot of similar stuff because of that deal and be able to close things. And if you were in the Directors Guild of America, I don't know what to tell you. You guys decided on your contract before everybody else went on strike. Well, I think so. they, they might have known that the writers were... 
Yeah, yeah, they they do. They do. And 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 their their contract is by comparison not nearly as good. Um directors. Yeah. <laughs> they're fun. directors, they're fine. They got their producer credit. <laughs> like they could just put themselves in as an actor or a writer. Uh they'll find other ways to make the money. Oh, but- every director now does a cameo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, it's gonna be great yeah, yeah. uh but i will say yeah. that, uh casey on stage code was like we're doing we held true detective because we wanted the we wanted jody foster to be available right. to promote the yep. show we wanted people to be able to talk about it and it's like oh the sag deal isn't done but they're very confident that the writer's deal is gonna give them the actors yeah deal. because so much yeah. of the debate is about the same stuff and i think i yep. think it it definitely seemed to be that it was likely for the guild to get the deal done first. And then there's going to be a lot of copying and pasting from this deal to that deal. Uh, Mm -hmm. Especially it seems with the AI stuff. And I thought one of the most interesting parts of the AI piece of this deal was essentially that uh, they punted on the question of training data. Like, can you use Mm -hmm. our work to train AI models that can make other screen plays? That there was a very specific reason for that. And that's because there's so much uh, like, Law, laws that are potentially going to an effect. So why hold on to this bargaining chip when you know that California, this like I think it was last week, California said, we're going to look into regulating training data and, and making sure compensation happens and stuff. So when you hear that, it's like, I will bet you $10 right now that this deal gets renegotiated again before anybody makes a law on that front. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and that's right. why if you I, know that you're, you're operating in three year cycles. You're like, eh, that's, we'll that's what I mean. Like, yeah. I think you're right, yeah. Alex, but I think, I think everybody was just like, who the hell knows? Like, let's come back and do this again in three years. If it gets weird, there's a line in here that lets us yell at you. If it gets weird, that's good enough for now. Enough yeah. For now. And I, th- I thought that was really smart on, on their part. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay, we're going to kick this can down the road. Yeah. Maybe something happens. Maybe something doesn't. We got three years to figure yeah. it out. Yeah, it's just it's just a funny acknowledgement of like no one really knows anything. So like, let's just be cool for now, and we'll figure this out later. Yeah. I thought that was like that was just a funny place for that to land. Um, all right, let's do a lightning round. Um, we are already very long, <laughs> so let's just blow through this, hit some more news, and get out of here. Um, I will go first, so you guys can come up with your own Neil. you can quickly read five days oh, of I know, I already and catch up and it's see it's very you obvious okay. no no that one's mine alex alex and i are fighting in the google doc right now <laughs> all right uh, <laughs> there's like two cursors like furiously uh-huh. selecting lines in the google doc <laughs> there's a lot happening right now uh mine is um there's this big shift in the podcast world i feel like we got to talk about podcasts on podcasts yeah. um Google is killing Google Podcasts because it's all in on YouTube Music as the home of podcasts. Um, I just like a random side note is I hate the fact that there are apps called Amazon Music and YouTube Music and their podcast apps like bad names. Mm-hmm. Everybody like you you screwed up. Uh, but anyway, Google Podcasts is going away because Google can't stop killing its apps. But it's all in on YouTube as a podcast platform. YouTube Music has been like a sneaky place of investment for youtube for a long time now and they're getting much louder about like we really think this is our subscription business going forward that's really interesting uh apple podcasts is going the other way they're they're integrating a lot of stuff from outside of podcasts into podcasts including some of the like radio stuff that they've been doing some of the different like meditation stuff that they've been doing there's just a lot of like audio around the Apple ecosystem that's now all being pulled into Apple podcasts. So while, while YouTube goes into YouTube, Apple is pulling into podcasts. And I thought that was very interesting. And also to everyone who has asked what podcast app should I use? The, there are lots of good answers. Mine is pocket casts. It's a terrific app. It's been around forever. Automatic owns it. The people who own WordPress. So they're not going to kill it randomly because they hate (laughs) you. It's a good app. Pocket casts. That's my lightning round. I can't even mention podcasts without people telling me to use Overcast. They just like show up out of it. Overcast is a great app. The only downside of Overcast is that it is, it's pretty platform specific, but otherwise it is a terrific right. app. Let's see. I feel like whichever one of you I call on right now gets to have this one. No, um, I, 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 I picked another one. Let me go. Stay me go. away. I'm not, I'm not going to touch you it. Stay I'm out of my chair. It. Like literally. <laughs> The earth. All right, Neil, I go. All right, I'm just, Logitech it partnered with a company called PlaySeat and they've made it. <laughs> They've made a Logitech branded racing chair. <laughs> I'm really unhappy because I own the same chair without the Logitech improvements. <laughs> I own the PlayStation oh. Challenge for PlayStation VR uh, and Gran Turismo VR. It's a great chair. Logitech, by the way, if you just look at it, I own their racing wheel. Now they're doing this chair. 
that company thinks there's a bigger market in racing sims and they're just like yep. going after it and they i think know, they know right. what's coming I, I think racing right sims too. rule i just want to be very clear i'm gonna end and up with the a fact that this racing. thing this thing folds up yeah. like that's i have not no, bought I one have, of these again because... i have the thing it folds up it's very good the, it does yeah, it okay. folds up and the, the wheel stays attached and it's all very compact you can get in a closet it's just you unfold it and you put it in the center of your living room and you're like i'm gonna use it again tomorrow <laughs> <You never fold>. <laughs> <laughs> like, nah. no my problem is i have to buy this thing without my wife ever finding out that i bought it <laughs> so i need it i need to be able to get rid of it very quickly at a moment's notice. And there's nothing like furtively hiding a receipt that says the words play seat on it from your wife. <laughs> yeah, that's fun to explain on the, the credit card. <laughs> uh, wait, so what did Logitech do that makes this cool and exciting? So if you just look at some of the, you know, the little lashes a little better, like they've made, they've made some quality of life improvements because they're Logitech. Okay. From what I can tell, they've just made it slightly easier to like operate the folding and the you know, they, they've just like made it more ergonomic, but I think it's mostly like the things that were red are now blue, you know, but like Logitech like is it. doing this because they want to distribute the stuff. Like Placey doesn't have huge distribution, right? They're just like a little company. Logitech's like Best Buy. Yeah. So like, I, I think they're, they're taking it and they're putting it out in the channels because they see a bigger market for the stuff. It folds down so little. I hate that I'm going to buy this thing. Dude, PSVR, Gran Turismo VR. We, we did this whole thing about the Quest 3. Yeah. And I am telling you that Gran Turismo VR on the PSVR 2 is one of the single most compelling things you can do in VR. I believe it. Like even, uh, and I'm like a car nerd and I love it and it's like fine. Like my friends, my family, I put them in the thing and like they're in this silly little chair and, they go, and they're like blown away. <laughs> you put a little fan yeah, in front of them, really yeah. get the immersion. Yeah. I stand right next to them going, vroom, vroom. <laughs> <laughs> just back the truck just up blow wind in their ears <laughs> Roll yeah coal we did on you know we did a we did a like a you know kids react video to project starline at code which is uh -huh. another thing that's impossible to show people um yep. but it's great we should do it we should do a video of people reacting there to grand Turismo vr because it's super cool that's a good idea uh i need to stop looking at this page or else i'm gonna buy this thing <laughs> alex what's yours same uh i just want to close the loop we know where amazon for amazon hardware chief david limp went oh, and yeah. he's going to blue origin so he's going to go build rockets. Just can't get enough Jeff Bezos, that guy. Just can't get enough of Jeff. So <laughs> that was like we everybody. Conversely, they also finally confirmed that Panos Panay is definitely coming to Amazon. Yep. That is happening. So all of the stuff that was up in the air, now we know where everybody is. Yeah. Dave's going to be over at Blue Origins. So Dave's definitely going to put Alexa in a rocket. It's like, <laughs> Alexa, take me to space for two minutes. <laughs> I need to float around a little bit. <laughs> And and Panos is definitely coming to Amazon, so it's both happening. I I've already emailed Amazon repeatedly about e-readers as soon as it was announced. I'm so sorry to Amazon PR, <laughs> but yeah, let's see it, Panos. Let's see the let's see a really good Kindle. As soon as the Panos news was announced, somebody just mentioned me on Threads and just said the words Kindle Fold <laughs> question mark. <laughs> That's all I've been thinking about all week. It's coming. Upon us, do I'm it. Give me it. my folding Kindle. Uh, all right. We have gone extremely long. We need to get out of here. No, let's talk about Lindy Acarina some more. <laughs> Neil, I need to go to bed. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we're going to go. Uh, I'm back, by the way. Like Code's a, over. Yeah. I am become death. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. The Eye of Sauron yeah. is back. Yeah, everyone who asked where Neil was, you're gonna you're gonna rue how hell. much he is back now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like I said, there's gonna be there's a bunch more uh, trial stuff to come. It sounds like Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, Dude, is gonna be testifying. Wait, you were there in the room. You, yeah, this week. we're gonna talk about that next All week. Right. There's so much to talk about. It's gonna be great. I'm excited. I missed about you guys. It. Satya Nadella is testifying on Monday. We think I'm gonna try and be in the courtroom for that. Lots more going on there. We have the FTC suing Amazon. The FTX trial is starting next week. There is like a lot still happening. There's a Google event coming next week. Uh, we are not short of things to talk about. Um, in the meantime, we're going to have a ton of code stuff going up over the next few days. Interview with AMD CEO Lisa Sue is up now. She she talked a lot about competing with NVIDIA. That was a good one, too. We should have mentioned that earlier. She was great, great and very interesting about like the future of all of this AI hardware stuff. That was really products, interesting. Products. Products. I put products on stage at Code. <laughs> the bullshit was the bullshit, but the products were real. There you go. Um, all right. We are out of here. Everybody's going to go just decompress for a couple of days, and then we'll be back next week. That's it. That's the Vergecast. Rock and roll. He took my line. <laughs> <laughs>